Hi guys, welcome back to another video tutorial on DaVinci Resolve 16. Today we're going to learn how to import footage, edit that footage, color grade that footage, sound mix the footage, and export the project into a final video or piece of media. So hit the pause button, grab a coffee and buckle up and let's go. If you can master this program that Blackmagic Design is placing in your hands for free, then you will understand what's happening commercially on professional jobs in the edit, grade, VFX and sound mix, or you'll be able to understand it fully and utilize the program to all of its extent in your home studio or your office studio. Now, it doesn't matter if you're on a PC or a Mac, whether you're using the free version or the studio version like me, what you're about to learn is essentially the same on either platform except for the command control click difference. So if you're on a PC and I say hit command click something, just remember you're doing control click. So that we're on the same page, let's set this project up as a 1080p at 24 frames per second, which is the international film standard base frame rate. Make sure you adjust the playback settings here and here as I've shown you before and change them to 24p so you don't get any playback conflict errors. Now before we start importing footage, the simplest way to understand Resolve 16 is that your workflow is laid out for you across the bottom of the screen. These seven pages prompt you to start your project from the left importing your media, how you are going to cut your project and flowing all the way through, through the grade and VFX and sound right to the deliver page. First, we have the media page where we can browse through our media, preview clips and import them into our project. But we can also drag and drop clips from a finder window into our media pool and subclip the media there as well. That's a really handy thing to know. From here, we can organize our clips into bins, folders, add metadata, or just leave them how they are, but that really depends on how you like to edit and how much time you wish to spend on project organization. Once we have our clips in the media pool, we can begin editing. Now we have two ways in which we can edit. It's either in the cut page or in the edit page, but which one is right for you? Well, they both allow you to edit like a traditional NLE, but the cut page is designed more for fast paced environments like daily vlogs that would be uploaded to a YouTube or Vimeo or something that is for a non-critical fast turnaround fashion. As I have been over the cut page in my last video, we will skip ahead to the edit window. If you haven't seen my last video, which is an in-depth look at the cut page, please click the link in the top right hand corner now if you're interested in learning the cut page. For the slightly more advanced users or editors that prefer an interface more like Premiere and Legacy Final Cut Pro, continue watching. Okay, when you click the edit page, we see a media pool on the left, a source monitor, a program monitor, and effects library containing all of our video, audio, and titles transitions. We also have a traditional inspector window like what you used to in Final Cut Pro and Premiere, so you can make quick and easy adjustments like transforming image scale, size and crop, the opacity of clips, lens corrections, stabilization, and the ability to animate and change clips, grades, or even add effects on the timeline. You can also keyframe these parameters over time, and you can also see the keyframe editor in the timeline and make adjustments there. Now that we understand the layout, let's select some clips in the media pool and get an edit going. If you wish to follow on with your own footage, push pause and play when you're ready to go. So I have this shot here of my friend and I wanna get that into the timeline and use it as my first shot. There are a number of ways which we can do this. First, by clicking, dragging and dropping the clip from the media pool into the timeline. Second is to double click the clip and open it in the viewer then play the clip or scrub through it with the mouse. Once you find an in point that you're happy with, hit the I key for in. This will automatically reduce the selected range of the clip. You can see that here. Continue to play the clip until you've found your desired out point and then hit the O key for out. You will now see an even smaller selection of the clip is now selected. 
You can either drag and drop the clip with or without audio into the timeline, like this. Let's see what Josh Holm has to say about who's going to win Game of Thrones. Who do you want to win the Game of Thrones? <laughs> mm. The little guy. Always root for the little guy. What do you think? Do you think Josh Holmes right about Game of Thrones? Place a comment down below and we'll see who gets it right. An even easier way to insert this clip to the timeline is by hitting F9 or the insert clip button here. If you're not happy with Josh's decision about who's gonna win Game of Thrones, you can easily replace him with another clip by clicking the overwrite button here or use the razor blade tool to split his clip in the timeline like this. We can easily select the clips and move them down the timeline. Okay, let's drop a title onto the start of the timeline. Just go to the effects bin, find the title here, click drag and drop it onto the top video track and adjust the length to suit. Double clicking on the title will bring up the title controls in the inspector. As this is a simple title, I'm just going to change the text and color. Then I'm going to fade it out before the first edit point. As you can see, when I hover the mouse over the end of the title clip, where I place the mouse provides me with different editing tools. You can see the mouse changing. For example, if I place it here, I get too many arrows which allow me to create the fade. And when I place it here, it allows me to trim the clip. In this panel, you will also find all of your open effects, filters, audio transitions, title bars, and many other things that you can use which can all be manipulated in the inspector. There are so many, you'll really just need to play around with them and see which ones work for you and your workflow and your project. Let's say for the time being that we are now happy with our edit. Then the next page to explore would be the fusion page. But there is so much to talk about here, it will really need to be its own video. Now don't worry, I will have some videos coming out soon if you wish to learn Fusion. For most people and most projects, you won't need it. So for now, please don't feel like you're missing out on something or anything because we will make some videos in the future. So this is it, the big mama, the color page in Resolve 16 and it is the strongest, most powerful tool in the software package. It needs to be said, the color tools you'll find in here are far superior to the color tools in Premiere or Final Cut Pro, but they do take some time to learn and get used to. Now that's out of the way, let's look at the interface. At the top, we have the viewer. On the right is the nodal tree where we make and keep track of all of our corrections. In the middle is a thumbnail view of the timeline and the bottom section is all our color correction tools and adjustments. Now, before we rush into it, there are some basic terms that I need to explain so that you can understand what I'm talking about in the rest of the video. There are three basic terms for defining color, and they are hue, saturation, and luma. Hue is the name we call colors. Saturation is the intensity or vibrancy of the hue, and luma is the brightness or shade of hue. Now that you understand the terms, it's important that you understand how to read the video scopes because these are the main way of technically understanding what you are doing in the grade. The easiest way to get the scopes to appear on a single screen is right clicking in the viewer and selecting show scopes. It's at the bottom of the drop down list. I like to use all four, but for the screen recording, they kind of get in the way a bit. So I'm just gonna use two which will be the waveform and the vector scope with the skin tone indicator turned on. The waveform allows us to correct exposure and with the color overlay turned on by unchecking the Y channel, it allows us to correct for white balance issues when the color channels line up unevenly. Now, if I overlay an image over the top of the waveform, you can see the trace actually corresponds with the image below. You can see that the wall in the background appears reddish in tone and how the trace doesn't seem in balance as it is mostly not white. The vector scope corresponds directly with the color wheel and I have overlaid it here so that you can see how it correlates. It shows us what colors are in the image as well as their saturation. The further the trace extends from the center, the more saturated or vivid the colors are. 
Now, if you're not familiar with a node editor, you may find this a little bit intimidating as a non-layer based looking concept. Like everything else in Resolve, this flows from the left to the right. On the left is the input and on the right is the output. When the input is disconnected from the output, there is no grade as the pathway is not completed. Watch what happens when I disconnect the node from the tree. The grade disappears. Now, as a funny side note, my friend is smiling here because we use the age old trick of filling tampons with boiling water to have repeatable controllable steam on demand. One of the oldest food photography tricks in the book. There's a little photo tip for you. Now between the input and the output is where the nodes are placed and they can change any value, RGB curves, contrast, saturation, hue, lift, gamma and gain. You can draw shape masks with power windows, isolate colors, animate any parameter, do qualifiers for color mask, color mask and you can even key and do 3D motion tracking. So let's now get into the color grade. Here's my simple workflow for color correction. First, set up your exposure or brightness of the image, then fix the white balance, especially if there are issues, and then finally adjust the saturation by either increasing or decreasing the vibrancy of the shot. So let's first make a correction to the exposure of a shot that best represents our scene. Okay, this one we'll do for the tutorial. To make a correction, we'll be using the primary color wheels or pucks. The horizontal wheels adjust the exposure and the pucks in the middle adjust the colors. The lift mostly adjusts the shadows or the darkest parts of the image. The gamma affects the midtones, while the gain adjusts the highlights or the brightest parts of the image. The fourth wheel is an offset puck which controls the entire image as a global adjustment. Now looking at this image, it's really flat, which is common to see with log footage, which is now commonplace with every major camera brand. This footage is Arilog. And this footage is from a 5D Mark II, so that you don't think that I'm using high-end cameras. I'm going to show you how to color correct both low-end and high-end footage. So to correct this shot, I'm going to adjust the shadows first with the lift control while watching the waveform scope. We want to bring the waveform down until the darkest parts of the image reach our desired black level. We will then bring up the highlights so the brightest parts of the trace sit about here for the Rec. 709 color space at the top. Then I'll bring the midtones down by pulling down on the gamma wheel. This gives us good contrast and exposure. So next we need to fix the color temperature, right? Seems it's a teeny weeny bit off. So let's fix that. We can clearly see there is a color dominating the trace in the waveform at the middle and top. Our goal before applying a look is to neutralize the colors and white balance the whites. Now you can see in this shot, there is no white. It all looks reddish. But because I directed and shot this interview, I know the wall of the Boathouse Hotel room is white. If I didn't know this, I could use the paper Josh is holding. Now my goal here is to get the color trace colors to align evenly, and when they do, the trace will turn white, indicating that we have achieved a white balance. A great tool to use to achieve this is the white balance eyedropper found underneath the lift wheel. It's a bit of a cheat, but it's a very fast and effective way to do it. Now, when you hover over a white object in the viewer, you should see the values of red, green, and blue displayed as numerical values. When the numbers are not even or even close to even, this is when you know that your white balance is off. Now, if you click on the white object, boom, there you have it. Look at that, look at the trace. It's now white, indicating the shot has been balanced but sometimes Resolve doesn't really get it perfect and sometimes I find that I have to do it a couple of times to get a better result. Now, if the whites end up looking too clinical and you're not happy, you can always adjust them here with the tint slider found under the second panel of the white balance controls. Okay, I'm happy with that white balance. So now let's boost the colors by increasing the saturation. Hmm, this is a desire to taste step. It all has to do with how you want your videography to look. Here's what the clip looked like before and after corrections. Now you can turn the grade on and off by clicking the number on the node on and off and you will see that the node changes from lit up to dull. And you can see in the viewer the grade turning on and off. If you want to see your grade, what it looks like up close, you can hit the command F key to go full screen and escape to exit full screen. How does your footage look?
Do you give it the tick of approval? Because if you do, hit that subscribe button, join our channel and our color grading community and filmmaking community for more color grading and camera tips coming to you soon. Now that we have color corrected our first shot in the sequence, let's go ahead and match the other shots to our hero. On the next shot, we're going to repeat the procedure by starting with the best balance of exposure with the lift camera and gain controls. If the color balance in the shot looks off, well, we'll use the white balance tool again to correct that, but this time using something else as our white reference. Then add some saturation to taste. That's looking pretty good. Now, we want the next shot to match our first shot because it's just a tighter version of our hero shot. To do that and save some time, we can copy the grade from the first clip and paste it onto the second one. To do that, we go to the first clip, open up the gallery on the left-hand side of the GUI, then right-click in the viewer and select Grab Still. You will now see in the gallery a thumbnail representation of the grade as a saved correction so that you can use it at any time in your session. Now let's jump back to that closer shot and apply this correction. Right click on the still in the gallery and select apply grade. Now you can see that it has given us a really quick starting point, but you can also see that they don't quite match. So to get them close, here's another tip for you. This is my personal technique. First turn on the split screen view and then change the drop down menu to selected clips. Command or control click the shots in the timeline that you wish to see side by side. We can now see them side by side in the waveform and exactly how they don't match. That's why it's so important to understand the waveforms. To match the traces better, we will correct the shadow, midtones and highlights to match the offset wheel. Then we will drag the tint in whichever direction we need to, to correct the color temperature, either warming it up or cooling it down. For the interest of time, that's a close enough match. And I've also gone ahead and graded all the rest of the clips. But you can see in this shot that the background mm, kind of looks a little bit off. To fix this, we will create a new node. Then we'll use one of my favorite tools to do a quick secondary fix, which is the hue versus hue curve, where we can place two points on the color spectrum to isolate the desired color, then add a center point to drag up or down to either lean it out a little bit in color or add more color, which is desired to taste. More like this. Now that's much better. Now while I'm here, I'm just going to pull a little bit of red out of Josh's skin tone to help him not look so sunburnt. This is looking much better, but I think we can make him pop a little bit more by adding a subtle power window vignette. Now go into here, the Windows panel, and turn on the window that is right for your shot. I'm going to use a circular window and draw the shape mask around Drosh and invert it so that it is affecting the outside of the power window and the background only, leaving Josh alone. Then we'll add some softness to the window edges so that it doesn't look so artificial and hides the correction better. With that, that means that we've completed our basic balance and color correction, but Let's say we just want to change one color of something in a shot, like this vegetable, an object that the client is not happy with. And we can select that object by using the HSL qualifier tool. To do that, we will need to add a new node and then go into the qualifier panel, select the eyedropper tool, click and drag over the food that Chris wants changed, and then isolate it. To see what you've highlighted, turn on the highlight feature, which is the magic wand you see here. Now more than likely, like me, you're going to need to refine your key and clean it up a little bit like me. So we're going to start by adjusting the width of the center of our hue selection and then adjust the saturation so that we get it right. Then we will further clean up the key with the matte finesse tool here by adjusting the clean white and clean black points. Once we have it locked in, let's turn the highlight button off and drag the hue to the right until we get the desired color. It's pretty awesome, right? And it's pretty easy. So once you start to understand the tools, color grading doesn't seem that hard. That isn't the only shot where we see this item, so we're gonna wanna copy the correction to our other shot. Okay, the easiest way to do this is to save it as a shared node. So if you right click on the correction node here, then choose save as a shared node. Then you will see that the label actually changes to a shared node and it has a little padlock on it. Now, when I copy this correction to another shot, I can just add another serial node in the node tree and then select 
shared node one to apply the grade. But let's say Chris has changed his mind and he wants all the shots now with that item to be a different color again. So you can do that easily. You can right click on the node, click unlock, and then move the hue slider to another color. This will then automatically update all the other shots with the shared node. Now, how is that for a time saver? Now we're up to the bit I love, the creative part. And this is why before I said the grade wasn't over. Here's the quickest way to apply the same look to all these clips. Okay, let's select all the clips in the range that you want to globally affect by using the shift key and clicking the first and the last clip. Right click and choose the option to add into a new group. Name the group, we will call this creative grade as we're creating the look that we're going for and click OK. Now above the node graph, change the drop down menu from clip to post clip group. What this means is when we make a change, it's going to affect all the clips in an equal uniform way. I'm actually happy with the grade, so I just want to apply a film look over the top of all my footage. To do this, I'm going to open my open effects menu. I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom and select film convert, click, drag and drop the effect onto the nodal tree. This looks okay, but I want to retain a dense negative look. So we're going to use the curves editor to adjust the exposure. Okay, here's a quick lesson on how this graph works. The top right affects the highlights, the bottom right affects the shadows, and in the middle somewhere is the midtones, shot dependent. For this, what we really want to do is only affect the undertones, which are between the blacks and the mids here. Let's drop a point here to adjust the mids. Now let's give our mids a little bit of a bump. Now a quick on and off shows us that the undertones now look a little bit washed out. So let's make the undertone point here to adjust the density of those undertones and keep it nice and rich looking. Okay, that looks great. Now we have much richer contrast. For color, let's add another node. Now I'm just going to make a simple color adjustment here on the screen so you can see how this is actually globally affecting all of the clips in the timeline. Now I'm going to reset that because I'm actually happy with it. Finally, because we've pushed the colors around a little bit now, I just want to make sure that we have clean blacks and clean whites. So it just cleans up the overall grade. Now to get nice and clean shadows, here's a great little tip. Add another node, call it clean blacks, and then go to the Luma versus Sat curves. Now the way this tool works is that the shadows are on the left, just like your wheels and your highlights are on the right. Anywhere that we place a point will affect that part of the tonal range by either pushing it up to increase the saturation or pulling it down to decrease it. So this is a really powerful tool for reducing saturation in the shadow areas of your shots without affecting anything else, especially your skin tones. So let's place a point here so there's nothing above it and a point here so there's nothing below it. Now let's just pull both of these down so that our highlights and our shadows are both equally desaturated. And there you have it. Our shadows are nice and clean. If I toggle this node on and off a couple of times, you can definitely see the result in the shadows. Okay, let's put on the final touches and go back to our film stock emulation. Let's choose one of the film stocks from here and see how it looks. Okay, let's choose another one. Okay, I really like the look of this one, but I think it's a little bit heavy handed. So let's go into our key panel and dial it back a little bit with the key output gain control until I have a result that I'm happy with. There, that, that looks really nice. Okay, let's play this thing back. Fantastic, I'm really happy with that. Now before we wrap things up and export, let's do a little bit of a sound sweetening Fairlight. Now Fairlight is an amazing high-end post-production audio tool, which was the main competition to Pro Tools before being acquired by Blackmagic Design. Now, if you know anything about Pro Tools, you know that it isn't cheap. So to be able to have Fairlight included in the price of this software is pretty amazing. Okay, let's enter the Fairlight tab. Now for time's sake, what I'm going to do here is really, really basic. Over here, we have access to the media pool and effects library, which is a list of all the VST audio plugins that you have on your system. We have an index section, which displays the track list and markers. We have the timeline and transport controls, a, we have a meter, a mixer, metadata and a inspector so that we can see the characteristics of any audio clip and pretty much anything else that we would need to make a polished audio mix with. 
So let's have a look at our audio and what we can do about making it even sweeter. So we're now looking at Josh's audio. I think I did an okay job recording it. I was just using a Sennheiser wireless mic, but I want his voice to sound a little bit deeper and a little bit richer. And I wanna see if I can remove a little, little bit of that background sound. So over here in my VST plugins, I'm going to choose the vocal channel uh, plugin and I'm just going to drag it and drop it, not on the actual audio clip because they have been cut up. I'm going to drop it on the channel itself. Now, I could actually put it on the audio clip and just have that clip itself uh, be affected, but the best way to actually edit audio for beginners in Fairlight is to just do it on a track level. So anything that you put on a track and adjustments that you make on that track will affect every piece of audio on that track. It's a very simple and fast way to edit audio. So I'm just gonna play around with the controls a little bit. Okay, now that's sounding a lot better than what it did before. And now what I'm going to do is put an EQ on it from here by dragging and dropping it again onto the track. And I'm now going to adjust the EQ while listening back to his audio. Now I definitely want to push the bass up and I definitely want to push his mid-tones up and pull the higher tones down because it is sounding to me a little bit tinny and I do want to make him sound a little bit fuller. Okay, now that sounds good. Who do you want to win the Game of Thrones? <laughs> mm. The little guy. Always root for the little guy. Now, you, I could go in and add music underneath this and crossfade it all and stuff like that. But that really is a separate tutorial, which I will have coming out in the future. But for now, let's move on to the deliver page where we're going to look at delivering the media in the more traditional sense. So let's have a look at the layout of the actual render page or deliver page. On the top left, you have your, you have your render settings, your tape and your clips. For us, we're just going to look at render settings because we are rendering, we are setting up a render out of here. For me, I always use custom, but if you're just delivering to YouTube, Vimeo, or want a ProRes Master, or a H.264, 265, or IMF delivery, or you want a round trip back to Final Cut Pro, Premiere, Avid, or Pro Tools, you can do all of those exports from here as a preset in the top left hand of the screen. For me, I always select the browse next to add a location. I'm going to save my file here. I'm going to create a new folder and name that folder master because I want to always know that it is a master of my project. And then I will name the file before hitting save. Save that. And now when you go back to the deliver page, you will see that the file name has now been changed to your file name that you have designated and your location is now set at the destination you just chose. We are just doing a simple single clip render. We are not using an individual clip, which would be more of a round trip for a professional workflow. Because we are finishing the project here and it's not going anywhere else, we are going to use single clip. We are going to change the video settings. Because I wish to have a fast export, I'm going to change the QuickTime from H.264 to Apple ProRes and then I'm going to change the ProRes to LT just for this demonstration. Normally I would be exporting at the highest quality I can, which is Apple ProRes 444XQ for a master. Now you can see down here that my resolution is the same as we set up in the beginning, which is 1920 by 1080 HD, and our project frame rate is 25 frames per second. If you see a conflict here between what you set up at the start and what you're now trying to export, it would be in your interest to change the frame rate so that it is correct. In the middle is our viewer window, which is going to view the project that we've actually made. You can scrub through it and make selections. And in the timeline down the bottom, you can actually see the project itself. And you can, if you don't want to master the whole video out, you can choose a selection of the video to export by clicking in the timeline and setting in and out points. Now, if you're happy, add the media to the render queue by hitting add to render queue and you'll see in the render queue over on the right hand side that the job has been added and all that's left to do 
is hit render. And there you have it. Okay guys, if you've made it this far, you've done well, it's a long video, but that really is the easiest way to import, edit, color grade, sound mix, and set up your export and deliver your project in DaVinci Resolve 16. So I'm pretty tired after all that. It's been a lot of work making this tutorial. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, hit that subscribe button, and then I will see you in the next one. Remember to hit the notifications. Bye guys.